This lesson is on Berger's disease, which can cause ulcerations, gangrene, and even amputations in individuals who smoke. We'll discuss some of the pathophysiology behind why this condition occurs, some of the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So Berger's disease is also known as thromboangiitis obliterans. It's a condition involving inflammation of small and medium-sized arteries and veins. So it's not going to affect large arteries and veins, such as the aorta, for instance, and it's not going to affect more proximal arteries and veins. It's going to affect more distal arteries and veins. We'll discuss this later on when we talk about the signs and symptoms. So with regards to this particular type of what we would call vasculitis, meaning an inflammation of blood vessels, this particular type of vasculitis is going to be acute and segmental. So it's going to have areas of or segments of the blood vessels that are inflamed. And it's going to be progressive. It'll worsen and increase in severity over time. And it's also going to be what we would call non-atherosclerotic. It doesn't have atherosclerotic plaques like we would see in atherosclerosis. So this is going to be important as well. Now, this condition is going to occur in younger aged individuals, anywhere usually between the ages of 20 to 50. It's not going to occur in pediatric populations or in elderly populations. It's more likely to occur in males. So males are going to outnumber females three to one. So a lot of times what we're going to see would be a younger male and it is going to occur in smokers. So it's going to be in young male smokers. So that's going to generally be the characteristic case of Berger's disease. And it's going to occur in certain parts of the world and in certain ethnic groups. So some of the highest rates of this condition are going to occur in Ashkenazi Jewish populations. It's going to also occur in South Asian populations and also in East Asian populations like Korean and Japanese populations. So it's going to be more a condition that we're going to see in places in the world like the Middle East and in South Asia and in East Asia. And it's going to be less common in places like Western Europe and North America. So what happens in Berger's disease to cause issues. What is the pathophysiology of this condition? So if we were to look at small and medium sized blood vessels, inside the blood vessel we have the endothelium, that's the inner lining of the artery. And what's going to generally happen in individuals, even if they don't get Berger's disease, is that if you smoke cigarettes or chew tobacco even, this is going to lead to damage or dysfunction of that inner lining, that endothelium. Now, not everyone that smokes or chews tobacco is going to get Berger's disease, so there's something else going on. And that something else is likely increased type 1 and 3 collagen sensitization. Now, the arteries themselves are composed of type 3 collagen, other parts of the arteries are composed of type 1, and then the basement membranes of cells are composed of type 4. But we're going to see increased type 1 and type 3 collagen sensitization. So what does that mean? So when an individual smokes cigarettes or chews tobacco, they're going to get, again, that endothelial injury or dysfunction. So there's going to be certain parts of cells or certain parts of the artery wall that become exposed when they shouldn't. And you can imagine little pieces jutting out of the endothelium. Now, in individuals that don't get Berger's disease, this can lead to other issues, but it's not going to lead to what we're going to discuss here in a moment. But in Berger's disease, it's going to lead to an immune response. So we're going to get a recruitment of T cells. We're going to get other immune cells coming into the area and causing inflammation. This is all going to lead to a thrombus forming or a clot forming. And these clots are not normal clots. They're going to be a big ball of cells generally. So they're hypercellular thrombi. So they're composed of multinucleated giant cells. They're composed of other cells. There's a big ball of cells that get produced. And then... Eventually, we can start to see if this condition progresses or is prolonged, we start to see an infiltration of certain other cell types into the artery walls themselves so that we can get some more damage to the arteries over time. This is why it's progressive. And it's going to be, again, segmental inflammation, as mentioned before, because of the fact that perhaps there's one clot in one area and not in another. So this is why we say that it is segmental inflammation. So a part or a segment of the blood vessel like an artery or vein is inflamed. And we can also see issues with decreased or dysfunctional vasorelaxation as well. This is going to be more of a secondary effect. So why does this occur in certain individuals and not others? It has to do with their genotype. 
And more specifically, it has to do with their HLA allele, whichever HLA alleles they might have. So for instance, some of the HLA types that are associated with Berger's disease include having the HLA A9 allele, HLA B5, B54, B12, and BR2 alleles. So in some of these, like A9, B5, B54, and B12, we can see these occurring more in East Asians, so Koreans and Japanese. With regards to HLA DR2, we can see them more commonly in South Asians. So it has to do with what HLA allele an individual has. And this is what's going to lead to a triggering of immune cells to essentially lead to an autoimmune response against some of those parts or proteins that get exposed from the endothelium, those epitopes. Epitopes are portions of proteins that can be acted on by antibodies and other immune cells. So there's parts of proteins that get exposed from that endothelial damage from cigarette smoking or chewing tobacco. And because an individual might have one of these HLA types, they're going to get a response, an immune response against those parts of the endothelium. This is the reason why we see it in certain populations and not others. So what happens in this condition? Well, as I mentioned before, it's going to be in small and medium sized blood vessels. So we're going to see it more in the extremities. So extremities like the arms and the legs, but especially we're going to see it in the distal extremities. So distal means farther away from the body core. So we will especially see it in the hands and the feet. So because of that clot that's formed, that thrombus, we're going to get occlusion of the arteries. So again, the clot forms earlier and then later we're going to get other effects on the artery walls themselves but nonetheless we're going to get ischemia we're going to get a blockage of the arteries or the blood vessels so we get ischemia ischemia is going to lead to pain because the hand or foot's not getting enough blood flow so we're going to get pain now we're going to describe this as ischemic pain so at first it's going to occur when utilizing your hands or feet or arms or legs what we can often see is calf claudication so pain in the calves when walking or utilizing your leg muscles. We can also see it in the arch of the foot as well. That's another spot where we can start to have pain. And then eventually, as time progresses, the pain can become worsened. The condition can become worsened. It can progress, and we can even get ischemic rest pain. So even without being active, we can have pain as well. So even at rest. Eventually, because of that lack of blood flow, we can start to get ulcers or ulcerations. And then finally, if the condition continues, the condition hasn't been dealt with, we can have gangrene setting in. So we can ultimately get what we would call autoamputation. So there can be autoamputation of digits like the toes and the fingers, but we can even see amputation of hands and feet as well in more severe cases. Some other findings we can see in this condition include what we call migratory superficial phlebitis. So phlebitis is inflammation of the veins. So there can be areas of the arms or legs that have something that can look like this. There's a red area where there would be inflammation of a vein, for instance, and it's migratory, meaning that it can move around. So there can be one spot at one time, and then later there can be another spot that comes up. And about 16% of patients with Berger's disease will have migratory superficial phlebitis. So phlebitis is generally something we may see in hospitalized patients who have IV lines in, but it's not going to be something that changes position. It's going to be where the IV is located. We can also see Raynaud's phenomenon occurring in some patients with Berger's disease. So Raynaud's phenomenon is where there is excessive vasoconstriction in the hand due to a trigger. The trigger is generally going to be cold, so we can get a finding like this. It becomes white, then it'll become blue. It changes color due to too much vasoconstriction, then there's lack of blood flow, and then finally we'll get a return of adequate blood flow. So this is related likely to that reduced vasorelaxation we talked about before. And also if there are clots, this can worsen Raynaud's phenomenon as well. Some other signs and symptoms include superficial thrombophlebitis. So we can see a thrombophlebitis occurring that's not migratory. It wouldn't be the exact same as what we talked about before. This is actually going to occur in roughly 50% of patients. And we can also see paresthesias, numbness and tingling sensations, where generally we're going to have a clot or occluded blood vessels. So wherever we might have ischemia, we can also have paresthesias, numbness and tingling sensations. How do clinicians diagnose Berger's disease? 
So this is going to be important because it's a diagnosis of exclusion. We'll talk about that here in a moment. So angiography is going to be the gold standard with regards to diagnosis of Berger's disease. Again, it's going to be non non-atherosclerotic segmental occlusions. So it's not related to atherosclerosis. It's segments of the blood vessel that is affected, again, due to that clot, due to that inflammation. And it's going to be occlusions of small to medium arteries. The large arteries are not going to be affected. We can also see certain findings like cork screwing collaterals. Because it's an, a diagnosis of exclusion, we often are going to have to do other modalities of diagnosis, including echocardiography. So perhaps there are clots being formed in the heart as opposed to in some of those distal extremities. So this can be important in excluding the possibility that emboli are being produced or originating from the heart. And blood work can also be utilized more of a secondary indirect way of assessing a patient. So we can see elevated ESR and C-reactive protein. And another way that this condition can be diagnosed is by a diagnostic criteria known as Olin diagnostic criteria. So this particular diagnostic criteria is going to have one, a current or recent tobacco use. So this is only, only going to occur in smokers or individuals who use tobacco. Two, in patients that are less than 50 years of age. Three, distal extremity ischemia. So again, we talked about the fact that it's going to occur in the distal extremities. Four, exclusion of autoimmune diseases, hypercoagulable states, diabetes, and atherosclerosis. Five, angiographic findings like segmental occlusion or collateral formation. And treatment is going to involve strict smoking cessation. Now it has to be strict. It cannot be anything but no cigarettes at all or no tobacco use at all because even one or two cigarettes or even a tiny bit of tobacco use can prolong this condition. It has to be complete and utter cessation. If patients do continue to smoke, over 40% will require at least one amputation in seven to eight years. If patients have some of those other findings we talked about before, like Raynaud's, calcium channel blockers can be used to help with symptoms. And then with regards to that ischemic pain, pain management may be utilized, including non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and also narcotics in some more severe cases. Please check out some of my other lessons, including subclavian steel syndrome and cholesterol emboli syndrome. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Please also consider joining as a member for members-only content. Thank you so much for watching, and hope to see you next time.